Chairman, we're just um, setting up real quick. Um, just want to make sure um, everything is straight. If you have any um, issues with the sound or the um, video, just let me know. And I'm gonna put a couple of links in the chat room. And we'll get started after that. All right. Okay, so those three. I think that's it. Okay. So let me go quickly. So um, first of all, yet I'll say uh, once again for joining in, I'm gonna pull up this uh, page right quick. Okay. All right, so we're in week three, so we wanna pick up where we left off. So we laid the first class of the OB course, we laid the foundation for ritual celibacy and cyclical fasting for alignment in the Medutu, in the Runu Pertinent Heru, the so-called Book of the Dead and so forth. And we went through that text, we went into some detail about that. Um, last week we started talking about this whole notion of ritual celibacy, um, talked about some, you know, how it affects you through the cycles when we talk about circadian rhythms and so forth and the purpose for procreative activity, whether it's bringing an ancestor or ancestress back into the world, or if you're not engaged in that process, then you're engaged in that ritual procreative activity or the invocation of the abosom who have shrines in our bodies as Afrakani, Afrakani people, African black people. So the various organs and glands are the physical shrines of the abosom in our bodies and so forth. And when we utilize our physical body to generate that kind of energy, to stimulate the energy of the ba, the ba'et, the divine living energy given to us by Nyonkopon and Nyonkopon, or Ra and Ra'et, the creator and creatress, we use that creative power as procreative power to invoke the abosom for ritual alignment. That's the other, you know, function of procreative activity, sexual activity. So we went into some detail about that last week. Now there's another piece we wanna to touch on with regard to that. And then um, then we'll move into, you know, the whole notion of fasting, cyclical fasting. Um, we'll finish this portion up with regard to ritual celibacy, this class, and then the next two classes will have two different aspects of uh, cyclical fasting and so forth. So. we want to uh, go to this, the link in the chat room. If you look at the link in the chat room, um, the Subain Pa link. Actually, you know what? Uh, that's the link to the Ojira Sim page. 
let me give you the link to the let me give you the link to the um, PDF. Just in case it doesn't, just in case there's an issue with the uh, connection. So this is the direct PDF. The page on the OJ OJ .sim site has the introduction, but then it takes you directly to a link for the PDF. So we did a PDF version of the article. Okay, so we did this article, um, you know, because it's necessary, the Akradim Bolson, the divinities, of course, who animate the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies, they govern the seven-day week, but they also govern all natural cycles in creation. So we had to talk about Akradim Bolson and Subain Pa. And the word Subain means character, and the term Pa in Akam means good, can also mean sacred and so forth, so good character, sacred character, and so forth, the divinities and character. We're talking about ancestral moral reversion within Ojira mind, the purified nation, Akurakani, Akurakani people in the Western Hemisphere, and just our people overall. Um, we have to put that information forward just first and foremost because it's, you know, necessary as part of the cosmology, as the culture. But then also, unfortunately, people tend to assume because they've been infected by the whites and the offspring that when we talk about ancestral religion there's no notion of morality you get that from the whites and their offspring who try to impute their immoral culture like pseudo esotericism and that kind of idiocy into ancestral religion or quote unquote african traditional religion and they start infusing those foolish ideas and then some of our people embrace that they've been studying some metaphysics or some nonsense like that and they try to infuse that into our tradition to say, well, we don't have morality like white people or, you know, the Bible and we're about spirituality. There's no right, there's no wrong, that that stupidity, moral relativism and all that nonsense. Um, so they start infecting the culture with that. And then some of our people, they want to get back involved in their ancestral culture. And then the first thing they come in contact with is a sometimes, depending on who, who they come in contact with, they come in contact with a great deal of immorality. And they people start trying to gloss it over. So we have to put things in the proper perspective. There is divine order. There is absolute truth. There's divine law, love, and divine hate. Creation unfolds according to divine law, love, and the, that's the expansive pole of order. The expression of order is divine law or love, and divine hate is the contractive pole of order and so forth. So we deal with that in the modern and divine law, divine love, and divine hate book. But to put it in context with regard to morality, we did this article and the various things that would violate the aspects of creation that the different Akradim Bosom govern. That's what we talk about in this particular article. So um, one of them we want to focus on, which is of course our subject matter. So we say within Ojira Mai, the purified nation, Afura Kanu, Afurait Kaitnu, Africans, black people in the Western hemisphere, we reject without qualification, lying, stealing, drinking, smoking, drug use of any kind, promiscuity, interracialism, dissexuality, homosexuality, other forms of sexual deviance, lust, sexual abuse, physical abuse, child abuse, verbal abuse, gluttony, skin, skin bleaching, cosmetic quote unquote surgery, procedures, implants, injections, etc hair straightening, fake hair, pseudo-religions, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hebrewism, Moorishism, pseudo-Native Americanism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, Kabbalism, Sufism, Gnosticism, Taoism, which are all, are all part of the same white cultural, pseudo-cultural complex. Um, Extraterrestrialism, sex cult, quote-unquote spirituality, drug addict, quote-unquote spirituality, and their pseudo-esoteric iteration. Pseudo philosophies, integration, loving our enemies, unconditional love, messianic nationalism, um, and the promotion of or desire for any of these things by our men, women, and children, 
our rejection of these behaviors and um, ideas is an ancestral religious conviction rooted in our morality. Our morality is an expression of our capacity to align with inyame wa inyame nsheshe divine order. Um, our morality is an expression of our alignment with the Aboson, the deities who regulate divine order and creation. And this is a return to our ethical foundations, it's ancestral, ancestral moral reversion. So we talk about Suba and Pa, these various different things. Whites and offspring put forth the false idea of you know, moral relativism and make that a doctrine. It has nothing to do with reality. reality. They pretend there's no such thing as absolute truth and you can't have absolutes. And in reality, it is absolute truth because the white snarl spring cannot align with ma'at or ma'a. They have no capacity to align with or experience absolute truth, the divinities that govern that. So they would like to get us to not embrace the forces in nature that govern absolute truth because when we do that, then we will recognize them for who they are spirits of disorder who only deserve to be exterminated without exception. So they have to make it appear that they have a place in creation and if we were to go against them and seek intelligently to eradicate them, exterminate them, then we would be going against divine order and divine love and all this other nonsense. So this is why they put forward this false idea of moral relativism, but we have to correct that record. So we go into some detail about that, but the, the key piece here, which is related to what we're talking about today. Um, on page two, we say, just as your organs are children of the Supreme Being and they regulate order within the body, um, the divinities, the abosum are the organs within the great divine body that regulate order in the body, of course. And then we, we ourselves live in harmony with that. Now, This particular article is dealing with the Abosom governing seven days of the week. Um, in fact, let's look at the page. So we look at the different divinities, what they govern in creation, and then what kinds of behaviors would violate their domain of creation that would take us outside of subine power of good character and you know, put, put us out of harmony with that. So for example, Awusi and Ajua, Osara and Aset, stealing is in violation of the functioning of Awusi and Ajua as regulators of the harmonious and interdependent functioning of the Abosom upholding divine order. So that's violating their domain and creation. We said we are against drinking, smoking, and drug use and all of that. Why is that? Because drinking, smoking, and drug use impairs the body and immunity and directly violates the functioning of Benna and Abena, who govern the immune and lymphatic systems, Herubadeti and Sekhmet, the divine immune and lymphatic organs in creation. The same is true of gluttony, placing undue pressure upon our organs and systems and so forth. If we jump down quickly to physical abuse, child abuse, and verbal abuse, those are violations of the functioning of Yao, Ya, and Abba, Heru, Son of Asar, Naset, Wachet, the Negevet, as those who administer justice and relentlessly challenge, fight, and combat disorder and punish its purveyors. So that would be against their domain and creation. Lying and the embrace of pseudo-religions and pseudo philosophies, false information, are violations of the functioning of Awuku and Akua, Set and Het, those who carry our prayers or invocations and ritual offerings to the Abosum and Nananom and Samarfo, and to Inyamewa and Inyame and bring their messages and guidance and empowerment back to us. If Awuku is the messenger and carries the, our messages to the Supreme Being and the Abosum and Samarfo and carries their messages back to us, if you lie or you accept false ideas, false information, false philosophies, then you're violating that role in creation because you're not receiving harmonious, truthful messages, messages that are gonna empower you. You're receiving doctrines, lies, misinformation that if you embrace it, incorporate it and act upon it, you create disorder in your life. So that's violating their sphere of creation. Um, so, but the section we want to deal with tonight is 
we're talking about ritual celibacy. Um, so we, we're going to talk about procreative activity as well as celibacy, and include both and see, you know, what's what. So promiscuity, interracialism, dissexuality, homosexuality, other forms of sexual deviance, lust, masturbation, pornography, and more, and sexual abuse are violations of the functioning of Amen Men and Afi, which is Amen Men and Heteru, as those who regulate the complementary union and divine balance of the Afurakani, Afurakani man and woman. And then we also talk about, you know, uh, skin bleaching and hair straightening, all that kind of thing, you know, um, violating Het Heru. She, she's the manifestation of divine beauty. Her name is Nefer, which means beauty. She is the divinity beauty. And whether we engage in that or support the engagement of that, because if a woman engages in uh, skin, bleach, skin bleaching, uh, hair straightening, or a male engages in that or supports it, then you're violating Het Heru on the male side and the female side. So, but when we talk about celibacy, and of course we talked about how we can recalibrate ourselves and not be controlled by the sex drive and so forth. So of course, when you engage that process and you begin to recalibrate, then promiscuity is out of the window because you're not controlled by that any longer. You're in control of yourself. Then you utilize that energy that you have and redistribute it as we talked about last week to empower yourself, replenish the spiritual organs with, and physical organs within your body, but the spiritual organs and so forth. That's like giving an offering to the divinities in their shrines within your body. But just like we talk about, of course, obviously, dissexuality, homosexuality is insane. The whites in their offspring promote that to destroy the minds of our people, destroy our families, destroy our community. Of course, they've always promoted that for thousands of years because that is their perverse nature. That's sexual deviance. But another form of sexual deviance is interracialism. That's sexual deviance. Bestiality is sexual deviance. So whether it's dissexuality, homosexuality, that's sexual deviance. Bestiality, of course, somebody trying to mess with animals, that's sexual deviance. Interracialism, they're all on the same category. That's sexual deviance as well. So, um, you know, instead of bring, you know, we talked about procreate, procreative activity, bringing an ancestor or ancestors back into the world, that's a sacred process. But if you copulate with the enemy, then you may be bringing one of their deceased relatives back into the world. That is sexual deviance and perverse because you're bringing a spirit of disorder into the world. So, um, of course, bestiality is insane. The whites and offspring promote that, of course, and they have always promoted that. Going back to ancient Greece and prior to that, they've always pr pr promoted this sexuality, homosexuality, going back to ancient Greece and before ancient Greece and so forth. They've always promoted that. They've always promoted promiscuity, always promoted pornography and so forth, lust in general. But then they also, when we talk about this whole notion of celibacy, unfortunately, we have to address the reality that um, masturbation is also sexual de deviance. We have to, we say unfortunately, because some of our people have been conditioned to believe that that's normal and, you know, orderly and you should be doing it and it's healthy because the whites and their offspring promote that. They promote it in schools. They promote it in, you know, just like they promote homosexuality, dissexuality in schools. And they have little programs for youth to join little LGBT programs. And they're sending, you know, little dissexual, homosexual, trans, gender, trans testicle perverts into schools to have little transgender reading hours with children and all kinds of insanity. They promote that. They promote it in the same way they promote masturbation because it's a, it's a form of sexual deviance. Now, some of our people, we have to bring that up because some of our people assume that if we're talking about celibacy, ritual celibacy, with regard to recalibration and rejuvenation, redirecting our div divine life force energy, the Ba and Bayat, um, going through that ritual celibacy period, redirecting that energy through ritual, you know, um, ritual exercise and so forth, but also physical exercise, 
um, so we can purify ourselves, reconstitute ourselves, build ourselves up and so forth. Some people, because they've been some, so controlled by the whites and their offspring and their fake culture and perverse you know, philosophy, they assume that means that our people are engaging in the insanity of self-stimulation or um, onanism or masturbation and so forth, which is insane as well. So we have to address that reality. So when the whites and their offspring talk about um, they have these books out talking about cultivating the male sexual energy, cultivating the female sexual energy, um, Taoism and Montak Chia and these in other individuals and Hinduism and things like that. The whites and offspring will always incorporate, either they're going to incorporate some form of dissexuality, homosexuality, or they're going to incorporate um, some form of masturbation, some perverse entity or action like that. So we have to show that that has nothing to do with our culture. So when they're talking about cultivating the quote unquote male or female sexual energy, what they can't talk about is the fact that us, we have a ba and a bayat. And let's get to that article on the ba and bayat in our Ojiras Sem. So Ojiras Sem page is in your, go to the link in the chat room for the article on the ba and bayat. So we want to get into that so we can correct the record on that. So this is the one, it's the Abba Nekabet link. Okay. So if you recall, we touched on this um, before, we talked about the Bob bird and so forth. So let's go down to that. So we said, as we draw in air and oxygen, we are also drawing in the solar fire of the Aten, Atenit, the sun. The commingling of air, oxygen, and the solar fire within oxygen has its corollary in the commingling of the sacred moot, the vulture, governing the lungs, as we can see. That's our shrine in the body, Abba or Nekabet, governing the lung structure. And we were talking about that in the context of. Um, Nekabet and the respiratory system, as you can see here. Sometimes she has the form of a vulture, sometimes the vulture on the head, as you can see her here, Abba or Nekabet, sometimes the vulture itself. And her breast and the two folded down wings are the, you know, heart region and the folded down wings, quote unquote, um, that expand and contract or bat batting of the wings of the lungs and so forth. So you see the vulture in the chest. But you also have within that structure, you have, that's the respiratory structure, the great vulture, but inside that great bird, there's a smaller solar bird, the divine living energy, that solar fire. Um, the sacred bower by it, bird, dwelling within the very same lung structure under the dominion of Abba. So we we go into the bond by it. So that's the divine living energy within us. When people talk about life force energy. We don't just talk about life force energy. We talk about the ba for males, bayat for females, abra, as it's called in Akan and so forth. But you have a ba, you have a divinity, a ba, if you're male, a divinity, a bayat, if you're female, the divine living energy, a child, a ra and riot dwelling within you, a little quote unquote bird or force you can direct to different parts of your spirit body that empowers you and replenishes your energy by connecting you with the energy of Ra and Raya, the divine li living energy of Ra and Raya. The whites and offspring don't have that. So when they're teaching about, quote unquote, cultivating the male sexual energy, cultivating the female sexual energy, they talk about a certain amount of chi or life force that we're allotted and if you overindulge yourself in different ways, you start depleting your chi energy, your life force energy. And if you waste it, then you're gonna, it's like a bank 
with an account full of money and the more you take away, the more you lose and you can't return it. So you have to, you know, hold on to as much quote unquote chi energy as you possibly can and so forth. That is from their perverse perspective. It's like economics for the whites and narrow spring. Economic theory by the whites and narrow spring is based on this principle for them of scarcity. So they start off with the premise that resources are scarce. Resources are finite. So if resources are scarce and finite, then your economic theory or your approach must be, how do you take finite resources and distribute them or allocate them amongst the people? They'll say allocate them equitably amongst the people, but of course they have never allocated resources equitably they have a small group of people running everything and everybody else is starving. So, but their principle is resources are finite, resources are scarce. How do we take these finite resources and allocate them so everybody can use them in some way? That comes from the whites and offspring living in the caves of Europe, it's snowing, ice and greenery is finite. Animals are finite, resources are finite. You better get what you can before the winter comes back and everything is gone. That's their mindset. We don't operate like that. For us, resources are abundant. Resources are infinite. Our economic theory, theory is not constrained by scarcity and finiteness. So when we have an economic theory based on allocating resources since they're all abundant and we're not panicked about they may disappear, it's about how do we live in harmony with order? How do we live in harmony with the divinities that animate every aspect of creation? What should we be doing with these resources? How do, does this assist us in building a balanced, harmonious community that's reflective of the order of creation? That's, that's the basis of our economic, quote unquote, theory or a structure. Totally different. So the same thing is true with regard to this notion of spiritual energetic resources. The whites and their offspring and people read Montauk Chia's books and other people building upon that and, and just that Taoist theory in general, but then they also are reading Hinduism and things like that. They still have that same mindset. Chi energy is finite. Chi energy is quote unquote scarce. You better hold on to as much of it as possible. If you release it through, um, you know, sexual activity or orgasmic release or whatever it is, then you're going to waste it and you got to hold on to it and you got to build it up and do everything you can to preserve it. And because you're going to lose it, and the best thing you can do is get some little residual electromagnetic energy from, you know, the earth or the tree or sunlight and so forth to try to hold on to a little bit. And in fact, you shouldn't release, when they talk about seminal retention and all of that, you shouldn't release any fluid because you need to redirect it internally and send it up your spine and that's what you should be doing because you need to hold on to it. That's the stupidity, the idiocy of the whites and their offspring. They don't have a ba or a ba'at. We do. So when we have a ba bird inside of us, our divine living energy, and the term chi, as a matter of fact, just to give a real quick um, proof of this, We talk about chi energy, um, and some of you, of course, have seen this in our off the origin of the term yoga book. Excuse me. So you have the term chi, chi or chi, the exalted one, quote unquote God, chi or ki, the winged disc, the solar disc, chai or kai, which is contracted to chi, the exalted one, a title of Ra, you see the solar disc and the divinity. So whether it's chi or ki, 
both pronunciations. You'll find in China, they use the term qi. In Jap Japan, they use the term ki. That means life force energy. That's because originally this is a title of Ra, the exalted one, the high one, the one operating through the solar winged solar disk. The divine living energy on high, chi, ki, that's animate through the solar disk, whether it's the winged disk here or the circle with the dot in the middle, that's the symbol of the Aten, the sun, and so forth. That is that title. And the feminine title is cheat or keat and so forth. And as we mentioned in the Amaru Kafo Adibisa, African American ancestral divination film, um, Kajara mentions she's the one who teaches Ra Seki, quote unquote, comedic Reiki, Ra Seki, the laying of hands and so forth in the Fang tradition of Cameroon and Gabon, where she's descendant of, and where her healing practice comes from, the laying on of hands and so forth. The term in Fang, F-A-N-G, the Fang people for divine life force energy is Ki, K-E-E, -E, Ki. That's the term in the Fang language. So we've always used the term Ki or Chi for divine living energy going back to ancient Kanid and Kamek. And then even the term Rei in, um, you know, in Japan and other related languages, Rei means R-A-E or R-E-I, um, means universal. So they'll say Rei Ki means universal, Rei, energy, Ki. But Rei is a corruption of Ra. And of course the Greeks would say Rei or Amun, Rei and so forth is really Amen, Ra. So they corrupt the name of Ra to Rei. And the universal force on the masculine side and then Ki is also his title. So Ray Ki, talking about universal Ray energy, Ki, are simply corruptions of the titles Ra and Chi or Ki. So that's just, uh, you know, peace. But, but the key is, with regard to that, Um, that chi energy for us, we have a ba or a ba, a force that is a child of Ra and Riot that is sent by Ra and Riot to come and dwell within our spirit bodies. This sacred entity, this sacred divinity dwelling within us to empower us and link us to Ra and Riot, Nyokonpon, Nyokonton, um, link our divine living energy to theirs, as well as the, uh, the energy of the abosum and so forth. So we're constantly replenished and have that capacity to be possessed by and replenished by Ra and Riyak. We don't lose life force energy. We, we constantly plug in so we can replenish that. And through ritual, we replenish that. So we're not in danger of losing life force energy. The whites and their offspring are in danger of losing the lower level electromagnetic energy that residual that they hold on to just like a battery can have some energy but then over time it becomes weakened it, it loses its charge and so forth whites and offspring have lower level electromagnetic energy and over time that dissipates and that's what they are fearful of so when they start talking about you can't you know engage in sexual activity and release fluid and so forth because if you do that you're losing your life force energy and you have to preserve it and hold it and internalize it and send it up your spine. That stupidity is because of their inferiority. They do not have this divine living force circulating through them, flying through them. So the best thing they can do is hold on to as much electromagnetic energy as possible. We don't have that issue. So all of that nonsense has nothing to do with us. Now, so let's get into a little bit of the by and by, but then we wanna talk about that in the context of um, what we do with that energy, whether it's not just on the procreative side, but when we're engaged in celibacy as well. So, by and by it. So, the term for the spirit, the divine living energy animating us is ba, for the man, ba for the female. Um, the ba or ba is a spirit force a child of Ra and Riot, creator and creatress, Nyonkumpon and Nyonkumpon, Odumare, Oshumare, Da, Aido, and so forth. As we said earlier, Ra and Riot, the creator and creatress, direct one of their children as a divine spirit force 
to take up residence within our spirit bodies. This is the divine living energy that animates us. It is the divine force operant within the solar fire, which we can direct ritually. This divinity called Ba or Bayat, a spirit assigned to each of us as Apurakani, Apurite, Kaitnit, African people, is seated in the heart lung complex region. Its energy expands outward, but is seated in the heart lung complex region. When we absorb solar energy and heat through the breath, this solar energy is carried within oxygen through the bloodstream, thereby permeating the entire body. In the same fashion, the divine living energy animate within and through the solar fire permeates our entire spirit body. We are not only vitalized by this energy, but for Akurakanu, Afurait, Kaitnu, Africans, Black people only, our Ba, Bayat, is also our energetic link to the Ba'u, Ba'itu, the spirits of the deities and ancestral spirits. So similar to the fact that you can have a pocket of air in your lungs, but then through your trachea, it's connected to the atmosphere and the great source of air surrounding the entire planet. And that air can get inside of you, but it can also surround your entire body and possess you like during a hurricane or a tornado and lift your body up and so forth. We have the divine living energy of Ra and Riot that permeates all of creation and all created entities. We have a portion of that within our bodies, but then we can link that small portion of divine solar fire within us to the great source of solar fire, divine living energy coming from Ra and Riot, as well as the solar fire that's animate within the deities, the forces in nature, and build a bridge of energy to the various forces in nature, and we can become possessed by them guided by them. Um, that's how spirit possession takes place. They travel across that bridge of life force, golden energy to possess us, um, animate us, replenish us, vitalize us, empower us, and so forth, these various different things. This is why you see the Ba bird um, with the bowl of burning incense with the flame arising, or the Ba bird with the solar disc on the head. It's a solar bird, an animate Fire, the winged animation fire. And we have another instance, so you'll see the head of the individual. Sometimes it's just a bird, period. Sometimes the body of a bird or the head of the individual who the bird belongs to. So you have a um, animate bird, a solar bird within your system. Physiologically, once again, the breast of the bird is like the heart. The wings are the lungs, so seated within your seated within you, you have the little the bird. You have the on the outside, um, you have the the vulture, with the respiratory system. So the breast area is where the heart area is. The folded down wings are the lungs, and then you have, of course, the head portion up here. So you have a little bird sitting inside of you. You have the wings, which are your lungs the breast, which is the heart, and then the head. So this entity is sitting inside you right now. When you expand and contract and begin to bat the wings of the bird and so forth, internally, the little solar bird begins to bat its wings. You're expanding and contracting your lungs. You're drawing in air and life force energy. You start heating yourself up. You know, when you breathe heavily, fast and so forth, you get fired up and so forth. You're pulling in that solar fire. That little solar bird's energy is generating, and then that energy begins to fly throughout your system. And when spirit possession takes place, that energy is expanded. It reaches out to the spiritual force of the sun or the planets or you know the oceans or river or whatever divinity's sanctuary is. There's a bridge of energy built, and then spirit possession can take place, guidance, divination, these various things. This is through that connection that we are able to engage in spirit communication, um, spirit possession. That's how divination happens. That's how spirit possession happens. That's how communication happens. That's how clairvoyance happens. In the true sense, when you're connected, you can see the crow or crow of, the, of an individual, not just lower level electromagnetic act activity, but you know, attuning to the spirit body, the crow, the crow, the ba, the ba of an individual. It's all happening through the ba and ba. Now, so we have a little bird inside of us. And then we go in a little bit more detail because you have the heart. Um, 
as far as the respiratory system externally, you have the great vulture, she's on the outside, but then on inside, there's a smaller bird inside the respiratory bird. You have the air, but then inside the air, you have solar fire. You have the lung and heart complex, and you have the great respiratory system, which is like the great vulture. But inside of that vulture is a smaller solar fire bird. She deals with the air. The little solar fire bird deals with the solar fire within you. And since they're seated in the heart, we talk about the epicardium. That's the aspect of the heart that the great vulture's breast is dealing with. That's Negabet. And you have the endocardium, the inner part of the heart. That's the little solar bird's seat within, within the body. So that's what we're talking about there. Now, we talked about replenishment. When we're talking, whether we're talking about sexual activity, procreative activity, or celibacy, we are replenished. But our body and body is replenished. We can receive replenishment, as you see here. You see Newt in the sac her sacred tree and so forth. This is the individual. This is the man. He has a bowl of burning incense, the flame arising and so forth. She is replenishing him, but she's also replenishing his ba, replenishing his divine living energy. And then that ba is going to get back inside of his body. You see her once again <clears throat> emerging from her tree. Here is the woman. She's replenishing her, pouring that libation of energy and so forth. She's replenishing the woman, her spirit body, but she's also replenishing her bayat, her spirit. So the sum sum of the sahu is the spirit body, but the spirit is the divine living energy, the solar energy. If you imagine golden solar light filling up your spirit body. So she's replenishing the ba bird, so it becomes vital and replenishing. Then that bird's gonna get inside of the woman's body once again, and she'll be vibrant, vital, active, and so forth. And she'll have an energetic link to the abosom the insamanfo, the spring being, and so forth. So we can invoke Newt to replenish our by and by act. We're not concerned about if we have sexual activity, we're going to lose life force energy. So we're so scared that we have to figure out ways to try to redirect seminal fluid up our spine or female ejaculatory fluid up our spine and try to get to the top of our head and try to create this misnomer, you know, um, microcosmic orbit and so forth. They don't know what they're talking about. So, now let's get to the, uh, so in this, this image here, it says, ba, Bayat and Ba, standing upon a pool of water, referencing the nursing aspect of the moot, meaning mother vulture, Abba operating through the Ochin, Abba or Neptune, the planet Abba Neptune, this is talking about Nekabet. This planet along with Yah, which is Wachet, quote unquote Uranus, um, are often called ice giants. So, so just so you can see what we're talking about here, Wachet and Nekabet govern Yah, are called Yah and Abba and Akan, and they govern Uranus and Neptune. And these are considered the two ice giants. So this article was talking about Abba, the great vulture divinity and respiratory and the breath of life and all of that. Um, and the breath and the life spirit and all of that. So that's why we were mentioning that in that section. So you see the solar bird, but they're standing upon a pool of water. The pool of water referencing the nursing aspect of the moot, the vulture, Abba, operating with the planet Neptune and so forth. Um, and we say moot means vulture, but moot also means mother. Um, air in the lungs must be moisturized to the proper humidity level. So yes, it's a solar bird, solar fire within the lungs, but you have to have some moisture in the lungs for everything to work properly. So that's, that's what we're talking about. We say we can project our energy through our electromagnetic field to reach out and quote unquote touch the magnetic fields of plant life, animal life, mineral life, 
and Afurakani, Afurakaitnit, African human life. Same is true when connecting with the spirit bodies of the Abosom and Nananoman Samanfo, the deities and spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors. Once connected electromagnetically, the solar fire of our Ba Baet can bridge with the Ba Baet of the Abosom and Samanfo to affect spirit possession and spirit communication. And the key piece with regard to us is we receive energy replenishment empowerment and guidance via such exchanges. And then we talk about plant life and mineral life and so forth. How do we engage that process? Ritual invocation of the Ba Ba'at, our personal spirit divinity occurs through ritual prayer, ritual song, ritual dance, ritual movement, ritual breathing, and more. These are, through these means, we are able to invoke our sacred bird, and direct that sacred solar bird within us to expand his or her radiance and solar fire within us so we can expand that force. Let me throw an image here, just as one can train a, and direct a bird through falconry, send that bird out to go grab something and come back. We can direct that solar bird within us to go out and expand its energy and connect with the other you know, forces in nature and abosom and samafo and so forth. And then we talk about meditation and, and that ritual process and so forth. But, so we need to understand that infrastructure, we have a spirit, a ba or bayat, that's connected to the spirits, the bau and baitu of the deities, the whites in our spring don't have them. So when we're, whether we're talking about sexual activity or abstinence, we need to understand that infrastructure. Now, um, now we want to get into this whole notion of what we're dealing with, um, whether we're engaged in the process or if we're engaged in celibacy, what are we actually doing? What's happening with the energy when we're engaged in that process? We talked about how to, you know, doing that and the effect it would have on us and how to overcome the, you know, we talked about circadian rhythms last week and how once you get through that short period within the cycle, then you're, you're not controlled by it and you can overcome that and you can empower yourself and so forth. We wanna talk a little bit about what is happening when we're engaged, whether it's through the act or the abstinence from the act, what's happening spiritually with regard to specific divinities, what's happening in our spirit body when we do that. And starting off when we talk about Subha and Pa, to be clear, now you can waste your energy if you're engaged in disorder because the you know rod and rider are not participating in that so you're not getting replenished if you're engaged in disorder so when we talked about suba and pa in the beginning and good character and so forth and the things we do not engage in you engage in promiscuity you're buying by it and not replenishing being replenished so you can engage in promiscuity and not being replenished that life force energy is not being replenished to assist you engaging in dissexuality, homosexuality. It's not being replenished so you can engage in interracialism, bestiality, pornography, other forms of lust, um, masturbation, any of that idiocy. Your life force energy is not being replenished by the divinity so you can engage in disorder. They don't support that. So, so what is happening when you're engaged in that ritual act or if you're engaged in celibacy, what's taking place? So we're gonna to go to a couple of texts in the chat room. If you look in the chat room. Um, look in the, uh, okay. So in, in the question in the chat room, it said, with regard to the microcosmic orbit, do we have something in the culture that is related to it? It builds energy and re-energizes the organs. Um, for them, that's what they claim it would do. What we have in the culture, and we're going to get, we're just, we're about to get into that now, but in a general sense, what we have in the culture is what we just showed with regard to the Ba and the Ba'et being replenished. That's the divine living energy that fills up our entire spirit body the solar energy that fills up our entire spirit body, it was being replenished by the goddess Newt when she was pouring libation into, you know, the Ba 
and the body of the male and female, they're being replenished by her. When you look at Hinduism and Taoism and so forth, um, they're talking about cultivating the male sexual energy of female. They're not telling you about any deity replenishing their energy because they don't have any. They don't have one. We do. They don't have a ba or a baet. They don't have a divine solar bird, a spiritual force that anim that's animate within them. So they can't even speak to that. But we can simply invoke Newt and she will replenish our energy. It's, it's that simple. But they can't do that. So they have to come up with some ridiculous, you know, twisted, contorted scheme about how to preserve lower level electromagnetic energy and call it Jing and then Qi and, you know, different aspects of life force energy and divine spiritual energy and so forth. But that's not really what it is. They're going to say that's what it is, but that's not what it is. It's a lower level electromagnetic energy that they're dealing with, but they don't have that capacity. So, so first and foremost, um, it's um, in our cosmology, we see that Newt, the great mother who operates through the atmosphere and so forth, she captures, the, the atmosphere captures the energy of the sun and distributes it properly. You have an ozone layer and so forth. So the ultraviolet rays that may be damaging and so forth, it processes that energy and distributes it and transmits it to us in a way that we can receive it and be empowered by it. She does the same thing spiritually. She receives the energy of Rod and Riot. Newt is the great mother bent over Gab, the earth and so forth. In this context, she was in the tree and she was pouring libation in a funerary context and so forth at nighttime and so forth. She's the atmosphere receiving the solar energy, processing it, and then transmitting it to us so we can be empowered by it. That's the, that's the direct, you know, cosmological foundation for replenishing the life force energy. Even the way they call it just life force energy, it's impersonal for them, the life force energy. When they say chi or the life force energy, for them, that's impersonal. For us, we have an actual deity, a ba, or by it, that has personality, that has identity. They don't have that. So they, they can't even talk about, well, what do you do with the Ba? What do you do with that male deity? How do you communicate with him? What do you do with the Ba'at, that female divinity within you? How do you communicate with her? How does she get replenished through another divinity called Newt so she can empower you? They can't have that discussion. They can't have that conversation because they don't have a Ba and Ba'at. So if you look at the but we're about to get into more detail about that. So um, if you look in the Coco Bo book, that link is in the chat room. This is the book, by the way. And in the Coco Bo book is four different articles and we're proving from the text of Komet that this sexuality, homosexuality was never accepted um, because the whites in our springs seek to force that idiocy into the minds of our people. So we proved that in the book, but there's a, one particular section that we wanna touch on quickly. We're talking about the two twins. These are not two homosexuals, these are twins who died and they had a tomb and they had their husbands, I mean their wives and children in the tombs. White Snow Spring would say that Neon Kanum and Kanum Hatep were, you know, the first gay couple in history, which is idiotic. And we show, of course, that the term, the term heter, but it's not heter, it's hata, hata, meaning to join together, to yoke, to unite. Twins, hata, we know it's hata and akan, the term for twins is ata and ata. In ancient Kanadi Kemet is hatar, meaning twins, but it also means to join together, to yoke, to unite. The Medu are the two people holding hands because when they were in the womb, they were united. When they lived on earth, they united. When they died, they're united and so forth. They're yoked together. They were in, if they're identical twins, they were one cell that split into two. If they were quote unquote fraternal twins, sororal twins and so forth, there were two different eggs that were, you know, um, fertilized, but when they came out of the womb, they were living in the womb together. They were yoked together. So you see them holding hands. It has nothing to do with this sexuality. That's how they were bound in the womb. That's how they came out. 
But the reason we bring that up is because of the divinity Kun Wemu. Flathorn Ram, his name literally means to conjoin the wavy water line and the little pot to unite with, to join, to join together and so forth. We can say Kunwem instead of Kunum, we can say Kunwem because in Akan, Oku Kunwem means a potter and he's the potter divinity who fashions and fuses, conjoins the body and the Ka, the body and the Ka, the body and the soul together on the divine potter's will. As you can see him here, And there he is, he's at the potter's will. He's fusing together the ka, the soul, or female's kayat with the body, fusing them together. So when fertility happens, then kunwemu is down there, operant within that process, fusing the body and soul together. Um, that's what's happening. So we were talking about that, but, when Kun Wimu is doing that, then his counterpart is the female divinity, Neat. Now, when we're talking about him with fertility, if you're fusing together the body of the person and their soul, this is during the fertility phase when there's a fusion of sperm and ovum, an ancestral spirit is going to enter into the womb and so forth, and Kun, Kun Wim is the potter, and he's fusing together to make sure that person is a whole entity so they can be born into the world talking about fertility, talking about conception, talking about all of that. That's what's going on in the region. So what does Kun Wem govern? What is the force within the male that's fashioning the form of the male and so forth? On the masculine side, there's a pot here that can, there's meaning conjoined, there's a pot and then the wavy water line of energy and water and so forth, fluid in the pot. What is the pot that Kunim governs? If we look at the so-called Famine Stella text, this particular text is talking about the Kunim and the seven year famine. And the text is talking about when there was a famine, the waters of the river did not rise. Um, to the proper height in seven years. And therefore the crops were not forthcoming. Everybody was starving. The whole country was suffering. The king said, listen, what's going on? We need to go to the source of the Hapi, the source of the Nile. What deities govern the source of the Nile and see what's going on. The river has not risen to its proper height in seven years and everybody's starving. So that's what the text is talking about. So we're not going to read through the whole thing. We just want to get to the points. And for example, here it says, where is the place of birth of Hapi the Na? What god or goddess presides over it? What manner of form has he? It is he who establishes revenue for me and a full store of grain. I would go to the chief of the Het Seket, whose beneficence strengthens all men in their works. I would enter into the house of life. I would unfold the written rolls therein. I would lay my hand upon them. So um, they're talking about in the 18th year of the king, um, his various titles and so forth. Um, this is to inform you that misery has laid hold upon me as I sit upon the great throne by reason of those who dwell in the great house. My heart is grievously afflicted by reason of the exceedingly great evil which has happened because Hapi, the Nile River, has not come forth in my time to the proper height for seven years. Grain is very scarce, vegetables are lacking altogether every kind of thing which men eat for their food has ceased. Every man now plunders his neighbor. Men wish to walk but are unable to move. The child wails. The young man drags his limbs along. The hearts of the aged folk are crushed with despair. Their legs give way under them. They sink down to the ground and their hands are laid upon their bodies in pain. The nobles are destitute of counsel. Um, and when the storehouses which contain supplies are opened, there comes forth therefrom nothing but when. Everything is in a state of ruin. And then it says, my mind has remembered going back to a former time when I had an advocate to the time of the deities and the 
Habui divinity, which is Tehuti, the quote unquote Ibis divinity, and the chief Kerheb priest Imhetep, the son of Ptah, south of his wall. Um, and where is the place of the birth of Papi the Nile? So he's asking the questions where is the, where's the Nile come from? What deities are down there? Who do we need to invoke to get in harmony with order? Then he sent his representative, Matar, set out on his journey. Um, he returned, gave me instruction. This is the king talking. He gave me instruction concerning the increase of Hapi, the river, told me all the things which men had, and had written concerning it. So they had to consult the temples and the shrines and the writings going back thousands of years and so forth. And they found that um, there's a city in the middle of the stream where from Hapi makes his appearance, the Nile makes his appearance. Abu is his name at the beginning. That's called Elephantine by the Greeks. The stones look like elephants. They're right at the border between Kemet and Kanit, Egypt and Nubia. Um, Abu is the name of the city from its beginning. Um, and the word Abu means elephant as well and so forth in, in Kemet. Um, it reaches to Wawa, which is the beginning of the land. There's a flight of steps. It rears itself to great height and is the support of Ra when he makes his calculation to prolong life to everyone. Net Chem Chem Ankh, or the beautiful life or sweet life is the name of this abode. The two Kerti um, is the name of the water and they are the two breasts from which every good thing comes forward. Here is the bed of Hapi the Nile, wherein he renews his youth in the seasons, wherein he causes the flooding of the land. He comes, the flood comes, the water flood comes and so forth. And when he comes, he has union as he journeys, as a man has union with a woman. And he again plays the part of a husband and satisfies his desire. So the release of the fluid of the Nile, once it's released and the flood comes and moves through the land, it's akin to a man having union with his wife and so forth. And then they talk about how high he rises. The union there is of the, that of the God, the Untoro, the divinity Kunim in Abu. He smites his ground with his sandals and his fullness, and his fullness becomes abundant. And the key for us is he opens the bolt of the door with his hand and he throws open the double door of the opening through which the water comes. You saw the pot of Kunem, the wavy water line, the fluid in the pot. He is at the base of the country. He is releasing the boat that releases the flow of the river. And once the river floods, it moves through the land like a man having union with his wife and so forth. So physiologically, the pot is the prostate gland and the seminal fluid that's contained in the prostate gland is released through sexual activity and it is kunem, the potter governing the pot, his little pot and so forth. And he's fashioning and conjoining the body and the soul when fertility is taking place so the person can be born into the world. So he's a reproductive divinity at the site where fertility is about to happen. So he has to fuse the body and the soul together so the reincarnation can complete itself. But he's in the pot, he's the potter, the divine potter, as we saw him in the potter's will and so forth. But that pot with the fluid is the seminal fluid. He unbolts the gate and releases the flow of the river. So that's Kunwem, that's why they call him a creator divinity. But he is connected and his counterpart is neat, the great mother neat. So what is Neat's role in this process? He governs the prostate, gland, and this is the, so this is just an article on the ancient temple of Esna. And the Temple of Esna is located in the west bank of the Nile. The site was an important cultural center in the Ptolemaic period, the Greek period, although archaeological evidence dates from as early as the Middle Kingdom, which is over 4,000 years ago. 
The Temple of Esna was the last Egyptian temple to be decorated with hieroglyphic texts. It was erected during the Ptolemaic period and enlarged with a hypo style hall, um, directed mainly in, decorated mainly in Roman times. The temple was dedicated to Kunem, the male divinity, and Neat. These are the two primary divinities in the temple. Now, So they talk about the, you know, temple and where it's seated and so forth. The temple of Esna was named Het Bau, the temple of Bayu, a temple of spirits, the Ba spirits. It's also called the temple of the father, Het At or Het Datef, also the Het Mut, the temple of the mother. The Temple of Kunwemu, also Het Kunwemu, also Het Neat, the Temple of Neat. Um, and then you'll find that you know his mo most of his aspects of the temple are in the south, because his sanctuary in the country is in the south, and most of the um, parts of the temple dedicated to Neat are in the north part of the temple because her sacred city. In Kemet is Saut, Misnomer Sais, which is in the north of Kemet. So the temple is representative of that. So they talk about some things there, but I um, want to pull up this information about Neat. And we went over a lot of this as far as Neat in the spirituality of the goddesses course. And we were making a distinction between Nanet and Newt, and Moot, and Neat. So we don't have to go through all of that. But Neat takes a couple of forms. She's a great mother divinity, but you'll see her as an archeress, but you also see the shuttle on her head as a weaver. They'll say self-produced perpetually virgin goddess who gave birth to the sun god and so forth. Um, you see her name spelled with the wavy water line, just like you have Kunim, he has the wavy water line, but then the T for the feminine, so neat. So um, you have neat to sprinkle, to pour, to gush out, to flow, to gush out, fluid, liquid, and so forth, um, stream, canal, secretion, emission. So you see her as an archeress, but you also see her as a weaver. In different traditions, you'll see it, they're talking about the deities. At first, the deity was a hunter, and then the deity became um, an agriculturalist. And they'll say, well, that was the shift between us being hunters and gatherers. And then eventually, we became agriculturalists because we learned how to cultivate the land. So that was a shift, um, you know, socially. But spiritually and physiologically in the cosmology, the huntress aspect is like when the sperm cell is swimming and the ovum cell is released and it's moving through the fallopian tubes and so forth you know that's the hunting aspect they're moving but then when fertility takes place and the fusion takes place then there's no more seeking and hunting a fusion takes place and then the um ovum the fertilized ovum implants itself in the womb and becomes stable becomes a quote-unquote agriculturalist and beca become begins to expand they're no longer moving around freely they went from the hunting stage to the agriculturalist stage. They went from the archeress who's shooting out the egg on the male side, the hunter shooting out the sperm cells and so forth. But once the connection happens, you go from the huntress, hunter phase to the agriculturalist phase because they're sedentary, you're staying in one place and you're growing and developing. It's like somebody, a hunter going around, a nomad going around, shooting, killing animals for food and so forth. At some point, they go to a region, they see there's water there and fertile land, they stay there for the next 20, 30 years and start building a society that grows and develops and so forth, a civilization. That's what's happening inside. So if Kunum is in the pot, the prostate gland, and he unbolts the door to release the seminal fluid, he's at the base of Kemet. He unbolts the gate and releases the Nile River and it floods and it moves through the land like a man uniting with this woman and quote unquote satisfying his desires and so forth. When the sperm cell swims through the seminal fluid, gets into the female and reaches the ovum and penetrates the ovum, the fusion takes place. 
kunwem, his name means to conjoin, as we saw earlier. If we look at the name, once again, kunem, to unite with, to join, to join together. And then he's the conjoiner. And he uses his two hands to conjoin on the potter's will. And he's conjoining the body and the soul. So he's, um, he's fusing things together. He's a conjoiner. So when that sperm cell swims across and meets the ovum and penetrates the ovum, then there's a fusion. Kunem conjoins them together. Just like he conjoins the body and the soul and fuses them together. So your soul can be in your body and so forth. Your kai, your kai could be fused together in the body. When the sperm and ovum meet, the fusion takes place and he conjoins them. Once he conjoins them, then his counterpart, Neat, as the archeress, she released or, you know, shot out, you know, the ovum from the fallopian tubes and so forth. Um, from the ovaries into the fallopian tubes and it is moving through and then the fusion takes place and Kunum conjoins them. And once they're conjoined, then Neat moves from being the archeress, then she becomes the weaver. And this is the shuttle on her head. And here's the shuttle, she's the divine weaver and so forth. And she begins to braid together the elements within the sperm cell and ovum cell. She takes the DNA of the male, Y chromosomal DNA and the DNA of the female, the mitochondrial, and begins to braid them together, to weave them together. And then the um, zygote is implanted, and then there's an unfolding cell mitosis division. And, you know, over the weeks, the child becomes, you know, um, grows and develops and so forth until birth happens. So the conjoining takes place, and then the braiding, the weaving. They are working together. The prostate gland, um, which we would like to, and just to give a biological um, corroboration for that. So you see the prostate is a walnut sized gland located between the bladder and the penis of the male, the prostate is just in front of the rectum. The urethra runs through the center of the prostate and so forth. It secretes fluid that nourishes and protects sperm during ejaculation. The prostate squeezes this fluid into the urethra and is expelled with sperm and semen. So that is the pot, the walnut shaped organ is the little pot that releases the fluid. And what's in the fluid is the sperm cell that's gonna eventually you know, penetrate the ovum and so forth. So that's kunwimu, fashioning and forming and releasing just like you did in the text. But then, that's the prostate gland. Then you have on the side of neat. You saw she's an archeress. You have the skein's glands. In the female human anatomy, the skein's glands or the skein glands, also known as the lesser vestibular glands, periurethral glands, or female homolo homologue of the prostate. Sometimes it's called the female prostate. The glands on the anterior wall of the vagina around the lower end of the urethra, they secrete a fluid that helps lubricate the urethral opening and are surrounded with tissue that swells with blood during sexual arousal. So the quote unquote ejaculatory fluid of the female is shot out through the skein's glands, which are the balance of the prostate gland. This is neat as the archeress that releases the fluid from the skein's glands and it balances out the prostate gland that releases the seminal fluid. This is neat in the body and kunemin in the body. The husband and wife working together for the beginning of fertility, for the fusion conjoining and the braiding of the, you know, um, sperm nova. But spiritually, just like physically, this is what happens. This is what they're doing in the body. They're taking the two sperm and ovum, fusing them together, 
they're facilitating that fusion through um, the prostate gland releasing the seminal fluid. That's how the sperm cell gets to the female and gets inside and swims and so forth. And Neek comes along, she releases that fluid, but she also begins to weave together, or braid together, the, the, you know, the DNA and so forth. So they are facilitating that so that the child can, you know, be formed and implant itself in the womb so it can grow and develop. Spiritually, the same thing is happening. But if spiritually this is happening, energy-wise it's happening, that release of energy from Kunwimu, the release of energy from Neet, and that energy bonds together and fuses together, you're creating the spiritual vehicle through these two divinities. And just like the child, you know, that body is created and then the um, spirit of the child is invested in that, you know, zygote and it can grow and develop. Well, if you braid together the energy of Kunwemu that's coming from the man, sexual energy and so forth, and the energy of Neet that's coming from the woman, and it's braided together and you create a sphere of energy that you invest your ba and by energy into, so it can grow and develop, you're creating some kind of entity. What you're trying to do here is you're trying to align your thoughts, intentions, and actions with certain activities to empower them. You're taking your energy as a male, the female energy of the female, you bring them together. If you're not gonna bring a child into the world, then you're gonna birth something else energy-wise into the world. You're gonna create something, you're gonna create a sphere of energy and you're gonna um, invest, you, each one is gonna invest their energy into that so you can utilize that energy together to accomplish specific objectives, to overcome, empower yourselves, overcome any disorder within yourselves that um, assist within you know, family development, communal development. You're utilizing your divinely procreative energy to create on behalf of yourself and the community. We talked about we're invoking abosome divinities when we engage in the sexual act or we're bringing ancestral spirit into the world, one or the other. If we're bringing an ancestral spirit into the world, of course we're gonna, sperm and open are gonna unite so that the ancestral spirit can get inside and that's how you bring the ancestral spirit into the world. You have to do both. But if you're not bringing an ancestral spirit into the world, but you're still copulating, um, then you're gonna have that energy from the male go to the energy of the female. They're gonna be conjoined, that's kunwimu. It's gonna be braided or weaved together, that's neat. Now you created an energic um, zygote. And once that energic zygote is created, that embryo is created and implanted and so forth, then you invest your, both of you invest your energy into that entity so you can grow and develop something that can be used by both of you to empower yourself, heal yourselves, empower your family, empower the community, every, whatever we need to do. That's what we're doing. As you can see, if you were to try to hold back the release of seminal fluid, like Kunwemu trying to hold back the release of the Nile River, the king sent you know, his representative would find out who's at the base of the country. Then the king himself went down to the base of the country and communicated with Kunwem and found out that was the divinity. And Kunwem said, um, the shrines of the deities have fallen into disrepair. This is why I have not allowed the Nile to flow. But once you all get back into repairing the shrines of the deities and start the offerings once again, then I will allow the Nile to flow and then abundance will come to the country once again and the people won't be starved. So he was going to find out how to release the fluid. He wasn't going down there and Kunum didn't say, hey, you need to engage in semen retention so you can be spiritual now. That's stupidity. That's the white snarl spring saying, hey, you need to retain your seminal fluid for the female telling Neat, hey, you can't be an archerist, Neat. You need to put your arrows away. You don't need to be weaving together anything. You need to forget your entire function and just hold on to your energy and send it up to the top of your head and down the front of your body and, and don't engage in anything. That's idiotic. That comes from the white snarl spring not having the capacity. First and foremost, they don't have a bi or a bi -act. 
reinvesting our buy and buy energy into that um, spiritual embryo we create when we connect with the Afurakani man, Afurakani woman. And, and we invest our energy into that even so even when we're um, um, physically copulating, we release seminal fluid and the woman releases the fluid through the blood and so forth, even if there's no physical, you know, um, fertilizing, the fluids connect. And through those fluids connecting, the energy that um, is animate within the fluid of the male is the energy of kunwimu. The energy operating within the fluid of the female is neat. And those fluids still connect through the quote unquote orgasmic release and so forth, but we create a spiritual energetic embryo and then we invest our bond by the energy in it. And once that grows and develops, we utilize that what we create it to empower ourselves, to invoke the Abel song, to do whatever we need to do. If we try to hold that back and say, oh, well, we can't, you know, release any fluid and so forth because Asians told us not to do that, then we're rejecting neat and we're rejecting kunwimu and we are not creating that vehicle for us to invest our buy and buy at energy in. Since they don't have a buy and buy at, they don't, they can't invest anything into anything. So they're just trying to hold on to a little electromagnetic energy. So that's, that's what's going on when we actually engage the process. If you're engaged in celibacy and so forth, what you're, what you're doing is you're trying to, you know, um, if you're trying to take control of yourself, if you were engaged in a lot of promiscuity and, you know, um, just releasing energy to individuals or situations, you, you get in a relationship with an individual who you shouldn't be engaged with, involved with, you could make the mistake of copulating with that individual and bring some kind of ancestral spirit back into the world who is a negative individual who you really don't want to bring into the world, into your clan. You're trying to bring some honored ancestral spirits back or even the ones who weren't honorable but you know want to come back operate within that clan to develop themselves and so forth you want to bring you know positive rounded individuals or entities into the world or at least the ones who they may not have been 100 percent spiritually cultivated but they are working to cultivate themselves you want to bring that balanced energy into the world if you connect with somebody who you you know shouldn't be with then you can pull all kinds of individuals back into the world and create all kinds of disorder, which is, you know, insane. If you're constantly um, lusting, then you're lowering your spiritual immunity, as we talked about before. And you lower your spiritual immunity because you're not engaged in, you know, procreative, procreative activity harmoniously. Then you open yourself up to be influenced by negative spiritual viral agents and everything else. So. Um, so that's one of the reasons not to engage in copulation just in a promiscuous fashion. You lower your spiritual immunity on one hand, but then you also have the possibility of bringing certain spirits back into the world that you don't want to bring into the world. Or connecting with families, the family of the individual you shouldn't be connected with, and they have all kinds of disordered individuals living as well as deceased that are impacting your child and influencing them negatively, even if you brought one of your own ancestors back or ancestresses back, but you connect with somebody who's a very negative individual and they have negative ancestral spirits and other negative family members, that negative energy constantly impacting your child for years and years and years, you're just creating a negative situation. So that's, that's what happens when you're engaged in promiscuity. So one of the reasons to take a period of celibacy, as we said, is to take control of yourself, not be controlled by lust so you won't end up in situations like that. Um, to recalibrate, just like fasting, as we're gonna talk about next week and the following week, to begin to recalibrate yourself, to build up that immunity once again, that you depleted through just you know self-destructive, lustful activity, to build yourself back up to normal, to you know empower yourself, embolden yourself. So when you're engaged in ritual, activity, whether it's meditation or ritual um, song or dance, whatever it is ritually that you're engaged in, and you're stimulating your ba, your bi energy, you're redistributing that energy through ritual, whether it's exercise, whether it's through um, ritual movement, whether it's through meditation, whatever kind of ritual activity you're engaged in, you're removing some of that focus energy from the reproductive area 
and redistributing it to different parts of your spirit body. And you can be in connection with another individual of the opposite sex and not engage in sexual activity. They can be engaged in ritual as well. They can be engaged in meditation. They can be engaged in ancestral shrine work. They can be engaged in different things. And even if you were in a relationship with this individual and you weren't engaged in sexual activity, you all can still generate the kind of energy where you can invest, you know, your spirit, your bi energy, bi energy into that, that um, kind of sphere of energy that you've created so you can um, do certain things. But let's get back to this. Uh, the Coco Bow book. And of course, diet is connected to that as well, which we're going to get into. We're going to start getting into that next week. Hormones and all that kind of stuff. This is another image of Kunwimu, Neon Kunum and Kunum Hetep, who are named after the divinity Kunwimu um, and their children and so forth. We just put that in there, but. Just want to show another uh, there's an image of need that we wanted to get to and it's down. Okay. We were talking about Neat in this other, um, the contendings of Heru and Set, and Neat shows up in the contendings of Heru and Set, but she also shows up in the, um, uh, in Kanana, so-called Canaan, she's called Anat and so forth, but in Kamesh, she's Neat. And we were talking about that because we were talking about the contendings of Heru and Set, but there's a specific version of her, as you can see her here, and the wavy line, which is the N sound and the T sound, the neat symbol. But the determinative symbol is the phallic organ releasing fluid for a neat. So why would neat have a phallic organ? Some people say, oh, well, she was androgynous. So she has an erect phallus releasing fluid. That's the reason why they have that as part of her name, because she was male and female at the same time, which is nonsense, of course. Um, that symbol of the organ releasing fluid and so forth, met to met to seed, offspring, descendants, posterity. It can also be inundation, emission of the Nile divinity and so forth. Talk about fluid. But it also is the term met and the milch cow. So, now, now we have a better understanding of why they use that, you know, uh, representation for a female. As we can see, it says the name Neat is spelled with the determinative symbol of the quote unquote erect phallus, which is also used for the term met to metu, meaning seed, emission, seminal fluid, posterity, offspring, seed, poison, venom. It, it is also used for the milch cow, the female bovine. This is important because Neat often takes the form of the great mother cow in the sky. She's the wave energy within water, just like Newt to Nanut is the wave energy within the black substance of space. Neat is the wave energy within water. That's why they say she gives birth to Ra. You see Newt, the great mother atmosphere, but then the water in the atmosphere is mu or moot, and then the energy within the water is neat. Um, she takes the form of a great mother cow. And we were just talking about so does neat, had a ruin, neat, and so forth. But um, in this context, when it's talking about the fluid and inundation um, and the milch cow, 
as neat. It's not really, they, they utilize the erect phallus and the release of fluid. But what's going on is, of course, during the sexual act, the female also has an organ that's akin to an erect phallus, which is the clitoris and so forth. I um, mean, then she also releases fluid, which is from the skin glands. Now, for a number of years, for decades, the Weissman offspring didn't even know about the skin glands. They discovered that. So some people were not aware. They didn't know if females were releasing fluid or females were just releasing, you know, um, from their bladder, releasing urine and so forth or water. They didn't know what was going on. Then they found out that there's a such thing as paraurethral glands. And they're the skin glands and they're often called the female prostate and they have their own fluid. So once they discovered that, they were like, oh, just like males release seminal fluid during the sexual act and so forth, females also have an organ that's akin to the prostate that releases female fluid. They didn't know about that before. They didn't know about the shooting, quote unquote, ejaculatory or shooting fluid coming from the woman. But they found that out and then they call it the skin glands after the individual who quote unquote found it. But of course, we know who Neat is. She's the husband of the male divinity that releases the seminal fluid from his pot, the prostate. And of course, the female is going to be the woman and she releases her female fluid and neat means to release or shoot out or pour out as we saw earlier. Just to go back to that. Um, of course, we already had that in the cosmology. Of course, she's going to be the counterpart of the male divinity who governs the pot or the prostate. Neat to sprinkle, but also to pour out, to flow, to gush out fluid, liquid, emissions, issues, secretion, emissions, and so forth. That is neat. The archeress shooting out and releasing the fluid before she becomes the weaver who's going to braid that DNA together. So that's why they have her with the quote unquote erect phallus with the release of fluid. That's the clitoris and the release of fluid through the skin, so-called skin glands. So we have everything in place. So physiologically, you know, conjoining and braiding or weaving. And then the child, you know, the zygote is implanted and there's a birth of a new entity that's gonna bring a new energy into the world. Spiritually fused together, Afrakani man, Afrakani woman through the fluid of Kungwimu and the fluid emissions of Neat. When those two fluids come together, the energy is braided together as well and you give birth to an energetic sphere that you invest your body and body energy into um, to you know, engage in ritual to provoke the abosome together, provoke the, invoke the insomafo together and so forth and those kinds of things. So that's, that's what's going on. So, but then when we have, you know, we take these periods of celibacy, um, you're, you're stimulating and regenerating and recalibrating yourself. If you're a male on the same side, if you're a female, you're stimulating those simmers, centers of kunwimu in the male, on the male side or neat on the female side that includes diet and so forth, which we'll talk about, excuse me, um, for, you know, proper quote unquote reproductive health and everything, the kind of herbs and so forth, and just health in, in general, that's gonna include that as well. But you're still utilizing that same energy. You're invoking kunwimu to regenerate yourself. You're invoking newt uh, to replenish your ba, your ba, your divine living energy in that process. So when you're engaged in ritual, you know, meditation or any other ritual and so forth, you're still stimulating that energy, but you're building yourself back up. You're building up your spiritual immunity. You're refocusing your ajuni, your mind. You're releasing that lust, misguided desire. You're not you don't have that inclination for promiscuity any, anymore. You're not going to waste your energy investing it with another individual who you could create disorder with. You're only going to want to connect with the individual that balances you out. When you pull back for a minute, you know, recalibrate yourself, then you only have the desire, inclination to connect with the individual who actually spiritually and physically balances you out on the male side as well as the, the female side. I see we had a couple of <clears throat> questions or 
statements in the chat room. Let's see. And of course, you can post the questions still in the chat room if you need to. Um, let me see. Okay, so there's one question, we'll get to that. Um, said, is, is neat the same as moot? Okay, let's touch on that real quick. So, and in fact, in this document, this document is from the, this particular short little document is from our Mtoto to Seneb, Biospirituality of the Goddesses. So we have Aminet, she's the great mother. So we have Aminet, That's the great mother. And you see Amen and Amenet together. Ka and Kayat, the black substance of space. So within the great divine body is the melanin, the black melanin, which is the black substance of space. That is the melanin within the great divine body of the supreme being, including Amenet. Same thing in your body. Then you have energy moving through that black substance, moving through the Ka, the Kayat. The energy moving within the black substance is noon on the male side and nonet or nunet on the female side. That is nonet here, this noon and nonet and so forth. When you look at the planet Earth, you have the crust of Earth, which is Geb, and then the atmosphere surrounding Earth, which is Newt. And you'll see her bent over the Earth, and you see Shu, which is the air in between. So you have the crust of the earth and you have the atmosphere and you'll see the stars of the sky in Newt's body sometimes. But the air in, you know, within the atmosphere is full of moisture. It's called keb or kebhid, it's full of moisture. The word for water or moisture in ancient Kanin Kemet is moot. So whether it's the ocean, that's moot, that's water. The moisture in the air, is a form of water and that's moot as well. But when you have water, for example, the ocean, a water is a conductor of like electricity. The energetic force moving within water is neat. The energetic force moving within the black substance of space, that gravitational heavy magnetic energy moving within the black substance of space, that is noon and nonet. So that's the difference. The black substance have its, has its own energy force that's noon and nonet. Water, whether it's the ocean or any other kind of water, it has its own wavy energy that is neat on the female side and kunrimu on the male side. But the water itself, the word for water is moot. And the word for mother is moot as well. So you have moot, which is the great ocean, and the wave energy inside the great ocean is neat. You have kayat, the black substance of space, and then the wave energy within the black substance of space is not net. So in, a, in the first part of that class on neat, we go through the pedigree of neat, starting with aminet and then kayat and non net and newt and neat and mood and show the differences between all of them. because people do mix, mix up those divinities. And then so-called Egyptologists will say, oh, well, Nita is just a form of nude or she's a form of Hathor and all, which is misinformation. Okay, so, um, yeah, so those hormones injected into foods, of course, lead to all kinds of disease. That's the first and foremost. They don't put hormones in foods just to increase the yield. First and foremost, they want to destroy the bodies of the people so people can be controlled by lust and misguided desire. And they can be self-destructive. It's a form of drugging people. That's the purpose of GMO foods and everything else is to drug people, make them you know, controlled by hormones, lustful, 
if you're lustful, you're self-destructive, you make bad decisions and so forth, it creates disorder within your life and the life of you know, people connected to you and so forth. And eventually it leads to disease, cancerous diseases and so forth. You die early, you suffer and so forth. The whites and offspring, they're being in control, whether it's their own people as well as ours, even when they're in Europe in this medieval times and you have the people in charge, the nobles and so forth and the royalty, and then they have little serfs and peasants. They've always treated their own people with disdain and make them serfs and peasants. But then when it comes to us, they all come together, the serfs, the peasants, the royals, the nobles, all come together against our people. So it's not like we have some alliance with the serfs and peasants because we do not. But um, the purpose of that is, you know, uh, first and foremost to make the people self-destructive while they're alive, but then also to hasten their own deaths. So they're always under control, the people. And they put that in our food so we can be self-destructive, lustful, and everything else. So yes, whether it's, you know, in the meats and everything, but then also they'll do the same thing with regard to um, or um, non-organic fruits and vegetables and everything else. They're always injecting things or, you know, modifying things genetically to attack us. Um, so yeah, um, that information when they're talking about, um, it's one thing when the whites and their offspring are using satellites to try to, you know, disrupt communications and talk about Microsoft and they're trying to create a, you know, a, a field around earth and everything else. They, they've always been trying to do that kind of thing, trying to block sunlight. That's, that has to do with them. When they talk about the sun and you know, you need to stay out of sunlight and skin cancer and all that. That has to do with them. The sun is, you know, um, an enemy for them. But when they start going into overly sensationalized things like extraterrestrials or they're creating new suns or all that kind of stuff, that's just them manufacturing things as a distraction, but it has no basis in, you know, reality or our cosmology. So always consider those sources. If it's not coming from our cosmological foundation, from our real cosmological foundation, not what some new age white quote unquote Egyptologist or spiritualist is saying about the pyramids and trying to say they're aliens and all this other nonsense, coming from our own ancestral religious proper view and understanding and insight into what's being talked about cosmologically. If it's not coming from that, then it's not the real deal. But um, so we needed to go through that uh, with regard to what sexual activity actually is, what it's actually doing. We already know what happens when we bring an ancestral sphere back into the world. But we needed to go through those, that step-by-step -step process and who's governing what, especially with Kumwimu and, and Neat, governing the prostate and the skin glands and what happens when the fluids and the energy fuses, because all of this information about cultivating the male and female sexual energy they don't even know what that is. So if we were following them, then they, you know, those books are talking about um, it's normal to engage in masturbation and all the kind of stupidity, and that's self-destructive and perverse as well. And you'll notice that the Whites and Offspring started promoting that heavily, starting, if you do the history and the true history, and, and those who've been around long enough, you'll see that it was the early 90s. They've been promoting this sexuality, homosexuality for a while, but in the early 90s, they started utilizing R&B music as well as like deaf comedy jam, BT comic view, um, and then different shows, but it was comedians and then R&B music. They started infusing messages with regard to dissexuality, homosexuality with the lesbian aspect first, because they thought that would be easier to push on people. So comedians, they start trying to make you laugh at it. Because at first, you know, our people are, of course, we're totally against that. So you're not in the 60s and 70s and 80s, somebody talking about they're a lesbian or a homosexual, they'll get beat down, they may even get killed or whatever. People are not, weren't having that. But they start easing it in with regard to, you know, um, R&B music, but first that comedy and so forth, trying to get people to laugh at it and start laughing and saying, oh, okay, that's kind of funny and trying to make 
homo jokes and trying to make people laugh at it as, as opposed to being, you know, getting violent with regard to it. But then they started easing messages into, you know, R&B music and trying to make it part of something being central and so forth. They did the same thing with drug use. It used to be a notion of somebody smoking weed was no seen no different than a crackhead or a heroin user. It was not something that was celebrated. And they started easing it in with comedians and then R&B music and then later on with hip hop music and so forth. And after about 10 years of constantly putting those messages in there, if somebody's 10 years old in 1992, when people are totally against homosexuality, dissexuality, drug use and so forth, and then by the time it's so-called 2002, 13,002, and they are, they are, you know, 20 years old now, they've been raised on, you know, Ricky Lake and um, Jerry Springer and all these perverse shows and they're showing interracialism. They're talking about drug use. They're trying to make being lesbian cool, like there's something wrong with you if you've never tried it and so forth. It's taking them much longer to, you know, force in male dissexuality because, you know, through hip hop, they couldn't do that because brothers weren't having that. They, you know, calling people faggots and everything else still beating them down or even eradicating them. So it took much longer, but just now they're starting to finally get to the point. They're trying to normalize dissexuality, male dissexuality and putting out male gay rappers and all that other nonsense. They've been trying for a very long time, but it took them a while to get to that point. So they've been promoting dissexuality. They've been promoting drug use um, and they've been promoting masturbation as something normal but that's never been normal for black people. That's perverse and white people that's been normal for, but it's never been normal for us. For us, that's insane. That's some perverted, self-destructive um, white stuff that you know some pervert would engage in. Somebody who couldn't get a woman, some little white nerdy individual who can't get a woman there sitting in their mother's basement buying pornographic magazines and all that kind of stuff and engaged in, you know, debauchery and so forth. That's what they do. And if some black person even thought about or heard about that, you have to be, in our language, you're a bitch ass nigga if you're trying to engage in something like that. What are you doing? You, you're a white cracker if you're trying to do something like that. We didn't grow up even knowing what that was. But the whites and their offspring started to promote that heavily and it started seeping into comedy. And if you look at the history, early 90s, the little black comedians that they would promote are the ones who would throw something in about masturbation, throw something in about smoking weed, throw something in about interracialism, throw something in about first lesbianism and trying to make people laugh at it and it calm down and accept it. And then they started fusing it into, um, you know, lesbianism and masturbation and interracialism and dissexuality into, you know, R&B and then later into hip hop. The next thing you know, you have male hip hop artists and others talking about masturbation and this is what they do. That was never something that black men would ever engage in. You would have to be a faggot. You have to be some Negro hanging around crackers. You have to be a drug addict. You have to be some pervert to engage in that. But no normal black person would engage in that. Just like no normal black person would engage in bestiality. No normal black person would engage in dissexuality. No normal black person would be doing heroin or shooting up and originally no normal black person would be smoking weed, um, that became something that the whites and offspring were pushing heavily in the 60s. They flooded our communities with it in the 70s as a form of chemical and biological warfare during the time of the Black Panthers to try to destroy our people. Then after that, the crack wave came and they started flooding our communities with that. But in the past, you know, somebody smoking weed, weed they called it reefer and they would say, oh, that's a reefer head. That was no different than a drug addict. So it wasn't something cool, but since they promoted it with the so-called rappers like Snoop Dogg and these other individuals, then after you know 10 years, 20 years, people have been growing up in an era like, oh, smoking weed, you're supposed to do that. Everybody does that. Everybody engages in masturbation. Everybody engages in this sexuality or have tried it before. Everybody's you know, engaged in some kind of interracialism. That's cool, that's what we're supposed to do. But just a couple of decades ago, nobody, that was not normalized. So. We need to get back to what's normal, what's rea reality. That's why we had to go through that process of what actually happens in the procreative act, um, distinguished from you know what the whites and offspring are putting forward, including these Asians. 
And then when we engage in celibacy, um, how we're building ourselves back up. And once you engage in that kind of rebuilding, rejuvenation, then when you get back involved with somebody, you only have the inclination to get with the person who's your other half, the only who, who balances you out physically, but also energetically. You don't have the desire to be moving around, you know, just being promiscuous and engaging in any form of sexual deviance. You don't have that desire. But, you know, it's just like someone who does drugs when they clean themselves up, they get off the drugs and so forth. They can't even be around people who are just smoking a cigarette because it makes them sick and ill. Or if they're smoking some marijuana, it makes them sick just to smell it. But months before, they couldn't get enough of it. And if they're smoking weed and so forth, they can't, as soon as they smell it, they can't wait to go grab some more. And then they start looking beyond to try to get some other kind of drug like heroin or cocaine or whatever it is because they keep, you know, building the tolerance for these toxins and, and are looking for more things. But when you get all of that out your system, the slightest, you know, um, whiff of, you know, illicit drugs and so forth is repulsive to you because you've gotten back to normal. And the same thing happens when you engage in ritual celibacy. Once you reconstitute yourself and recalibrate yourself, then the idea of, you know, engaging in promiscuity or any kind of sexual deviance, interracialism, of course, bestiality, dissexuality, masturbation, whatever it is, pornography, all of that, it's repulsive to you. You only want to get with somebody who has the divinely balanced energy. You want to connect with their ba. If you're a female connected with a male, if you're a male connected with a female, you want to connect with her ba. You want you all's energy to, you know, connect. So. All right. Okay, and with regard to gut sun gazing, you have to be um, careful because, you know, you can you can damage your redness doing that. So it is, you know, you have to be very careful with that. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, so we just wanted to, uh, we needed to go through that aspect of it. I mean, we'd already talked about the purpose of the celibacy, but we needed to know what's actually happening. And we needed to touch on that because we've seen, even just recently, people putting this information out on, on Instagram and so forth. And you have black people with um, Kometi names and Yoruba names and so forth. But when it comes to the ba, ba energy, and how to utilize that, you know, through the procreative act and so forth with the spouse or what's actually happening. They don't know anything about that. So they go to the Asians, they study all that information and they try to incorporate that and say, this is what we were doing in ancient Kemet, what these Asians are talking about or what these Hindus are talking about. This is our ancient culture, which it is not. So they, they never taught you about Kunwemu. They never taught you about Neet. They're not talking about the ba and the baet, they're not talking about how Newt replenishes your ba and baet, and we see her replenishing that. The only replenishment for your life force energy you need is Newt. She will do that for you. So when they're talking about you have to, you know, engage in these perverse practices and so forth, that's not what's going on. Or you, you're going to lose your life force energy if you release your seminal fluid or the female fluid and so forth. So you have to hold on to it tightly. If you, if you embrace that false philosophy, then you will never fuse those two energies together to, to create that sphere, birth that sphere, so you can plug your energy into it to create something we need to create. So, um, all right. Okay, so we're gonna pick up on the, we're gonna move into the whole fasting piece in the next couple of classes as it relates to, you know, this whole notion of recalibration. So um, if you have any questions, of course, um, send us an email. And once again, Yeda, I say we thank you for joining uh, in. Can I ask a question real fast before we uh, end? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, real fast. So um, with the ritual celibacy, should we stay away from pop culture then, is what you're saying? You said stay away from what culture? What did you say? 
culture, like stay away from radio, music, and movies, and you know, because they promote the sexuality while you're doing ritual celibacy? It, it would be easy to do that. Um, so for example, um, you'll have a natural inclination. Certain things will become repulsive to you. So you don't even want to, I mean, there's certain music you may use to listen to on a regular basis. And because you know certain things are ridiculous, but then you just block some of that out because you may like the beat or you may like something else. And at some point you just, it becomes repulsive to the point you don't even want to play it. Or you may see certain films and so forth, um, action films or something like that. But then you get to a point where as you're going through that purificatory process, naturally it's just repulsive to the point where you don't even want to see it. Like for example, I haven't owned a television in, you know, like 12, 13 years. If there's something I need to look at, I can go online and pull up some information if there's certain information I need to see. But as far as just, you know, having a television and sitting down and watching television, I haven't owned the television in over a decade. And I haven't missed it at all. It wasn't like it was, you know, wonderful, <laughs> you know, programming going on. Every now and then they may have some something that's important or you may need to see what the enemy is doing. And you, you can pull that up online if you want to watch something or whatever. But um, you know, and I haven't missed anything. I'm not walking around like, man, I miss television so much. So, and it's the same thing with uh, certain music and things like that. Um, you can hear certain things and get some information to, you know, know what the enemy is doing, you know, some, you know, some intelligence gathering, but there are certain things that you may used to listen to certain hip hop artists, for example, and the lyrics and, and stuff like that is so ridiculous and it keeps flooding your, you know, sphere of awareness. At some point, you'll just won't have a desire to listen anymore because you don't want to keep trying to filter out the misinformation. They speak, they say things, they generate certain images in your head and then you have to repel that. It's like a battle. The, the images come in when you hear the music and what they're saying and then you have to repel it. Then they send some more and you have to repel it and you keep going back and forth. At some point, you just, you know, you'll, you'll feel a natural inclination to repel certain things. So some people start off like that and say, well, I'm going to cut off all of this stuff. And some people, they, they may not start off doing that, but they just engage in the ritual celibacy and so forth, and it just naturally happens anyway. So either way, it leads to the same, the same result. Let me know if that, if that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Yeah, I'll say that. So either approach is fine. Some people will say, well, I've been watching too much television. I've wasted a lot of time. Or I've been on the internet. I've been on social media looking at, you know, spending hours on that. And I realize I waste a lot of time. I'm just going to, like I know people said, I'm going to take a social media fast and they will go months and not use Instagram or Facebook or anything else. And then they realize how much time that they had wasted. And even when they get back on, they only get on social media to put out information that's important get to sites that are important that can actually help them, but just post and fight videos or, you know, nonsense or people just arguing back and forth or just silly stuff. They just, they don't do that anymore. And it's the same thing with, um, you know, television or music or whatever. People start incorporating different music choices, things that are empowering and the things that are not, they just start pushing it to the side. Sometimes up front and sometimes, uh, you know, it happens along the way. Okay. Okay, I just want to make sure there were no other questions. All right, so again, yet I'll say we thank everybody for joining in and your Bishop Bio. We will meet again. What's up?